है I'm so glad you all are here. <laughs> Let me get out of this for a second. Yes. If, and I will feel so bad for them because they're going to be mortified. All right. So I think there was people sitting with you guys, right? So no, you. So we might all be here, but if somebody um, comes late, then there obviously that would be my fault. So, um, okay. So we'll just get started. Um, so I did want to make another announcement though about the quiz for next Tuesday. So on the the schedule it says um, chapter two, but they came out this year as a brand new textbook. And so I've been trying to sync the chapters with the PowerPoints. And I realized that the content for that we're covering today, it's not some of the content, um, some of chapter two, we're gonna cover next week as well. So it's too confusing to just say chapter two because you're actually gonna be studying for stuff that won't be on the quiz. And, and so I'm actually gonna tell you this PowerPoint, this PowerPoint is what you need to study for the quiz. And then the bite wing section from yesterday. So that, that the very first one, this one that says intro to radiology, the bite wing slides. And so those were like the last, however many slides that was that we just covered bite wings at the end there. It, in the Moodle page, I think it comes in order. So the first one should say introduction. Yeah, yeah, and so the so from 24, so from slide 24 on, that's fight wings, and then this PowerPoint. So those are the two places, just those, those PowerPoints. That's where I'm going to get the material for the quiz next Tuesday. So um, I just wanted to clarify that, and then I'll repeat it again if anyone walks in late, so that you know what to study for for the quiz. And it's about 15 question, multiple choice um, quiz. And we'll do that at the beginning of class before we, because some of chapter two is presented in today, and some of chapter two is presented next Tuesday. And I. I think that's new. I don't think they did that with the previous textbooks. So we kind of had to rearrange a little bit. Just the bite wing slide. Just the bite wing slide. So yeah, from slide 24, um, from slide 24 on um, till the end. Mm -hmm. And then this, um, this set of um, slides. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we'll go along here. Just advance it. So here's the objectives um, for this set of slides, the PowerPoint. We're going to um, discuss the components of an atom. This is kind of a little bit throwback review to like, you know, earlier science courses and maybe even, um, you know, stuff discussed maybe in high school, even if it's depending on what courses you took when. But um, discuss conditions necessary for an X ray production and the factors affect affecting the quantity and the quality of the of the X-ray protons. So kind of remember that um, photons, um, not protons, photons, and discuss the difference between, we're gonna talk about bremsstrahlung and characteristic. There are two different types of X-ray that can be produced inside of a X-ray tube, inside of the machine. Um, and then we're gonna distinguish between particulate and electromagnetic, although really we've talked very, it comes down to like pretty much one thing when we're talking about particulate. We don't go in depth um, but we want to distinguish the difference between the twos. I think they like asking those kind of questions on national boards. So we don't have to deal with it very much, but there is a couple points to be made. And then identify the properties of x-ray. So those are some of the things we're going to be dealing with um, in this um, set. So um, you already have talked about atoms in other 
in other classes and other courses. So we want to think back to kind of what we learned of an atom and think about the main structure of an atom being kind of like a solar system, right? We have the nucleus in the middle um, with the protons and the neutrons. And then we have these orbiting electrons and they they usually balance themselves out. So we kind of think back to some of what this is, doesn't want to advance on its own. So things like, you know, things like mass number and atomic weight. And we we talk about it, but we don't get into too, de too much depth. The way an X-ray interacts with different matter does have to do with things like the atomic weight and things like that. But we don't get into it like super deep because it's kind of way, it goes past our necessity to know. But we do want to know some aspects of it. But here's just an image um, of an atom. The nucleus being like, if you think about it in ratio of like a football field, um, the football, you know, would be like the nucleus and then the football field would be like the whole, uh, the rest of the space of the atom. So it's, it, and then you have these orbiting electrons. So it's a very small, so this is not to scale, <laughs> to say this is not to scale because the nucleus is actually much smaller, but it has the neutrons inside and the protons. And it's important, the important part to pay attention to are the electrons and how they're in these orbiting shells. Because that plays in, um, we talk about that in the binding energy. So we're kind of focused on the electrons um, part of the atom when we talk about um, producing x-rays. So in the notes here, you're going to find, I, I didn't want to clutter the slide with the, with the terminology and the definitions. But these are the vocabulary that we're going to want to um, be familiar with for the beginning. So elements, they're substances made up of only um, one type of atom. So it's um, just one, um, one thing. It's not a combination of things. An atom consists of the nucleus and the orbiting electrons. We talked about that. And the core being the nucleus that's composed of the protons and the neutrons. Protons being positively charged, neutrons being neutral, and then the electrons carry the negative charge. So everything sort of balances itself out when you have an equal charge on the inside the nucleus and in the orbiting electrons. Um, and then we have the atomic number which is the number of protons in the nucleus and it equals the number of electrons outside the nucleus and that determines the atomic number. A lot of times we're not gonna, you're not gonna be tested on figuring out the atomic number of anything. It's just sort of a review and being familiar with, with these, these terms. Um, binding energy is something that we're gonna talk about because that has to do with how we make some of the x ray, the different kinds of x ray um, that's produced, whether it's Bremster long or characteristic. But the binding energy is a force that keeps the electron in its orbit. So, what it takes to knock out an electron, um, it's harder to knock out an electron. Here you can see, like this k orbit is closest to the nucleus, it's the one that's closest. It's harder, it takes more energy to knock an electron out of orbit in a K shell or in a K orbit than it does a Q. And that will come into play when we talk about the different kinds of um, X-rays that are produced. And then ionization is um, the production of ions due to the um, ejected electron and the atom becomes um, the positive ion. The atom becomes the positive ion and the electron becomes the negative ion. So just some terms that we're going to use um, in the first part of this class. And here I just, this is came from the textbook and it just shows again the nucleus and then it shows these shells. And you might remember from, you know, science courses that each, each shell can only hold so many electrons and we're not going to go into all of that it's a little bit more for this class it's more about like the binding and what it takes to knock it out um, but that's just kind of a reminder of how many shells hold the number of electrons but you're not going to be tested on things like that um, I in my notes here I did and this is actually a dry I, I um, have this later in a later slide but um, 
It says the energy required to remove the electron from its orbital shell must exceed the binding energy of the electron and a great amount of energy is required to move the inner one, which we talked about. So to remove an electron from the K shell takes a lot of energy. And then specifically um, for something like tungsten, an atom of tungsten, which is a type of metal, which is what we're gonna talk about as it's made is inside the X-ray machine. For an atom, a tungsten atom, it takes 70 um, kVp or um, 70, it's like an energy level. Um, in order to knock that electron out. And so all of those pieces will come together here in a minute as we um, talk about the parts of the machine a little bit more in detail. So what you need in order to produce an X-ray is you need lots of electrons and they need to be moving at high speed. So you need um, to produce lots of electrons and then you gotta get them going in a high, in a high enough um, velocity and then you need to get them stop really fast so when you do these things when you meet these certain criteria then you're going to create an x-ray beam or a central ray so um that's i think i mentioned this yesterday you can sort of imagine it like a car that's driving really fast and it hits a wall and then parts of the car are going to fly off and so we think of those pieces that are flying off as the x-ray um photons so when a high speed electron is suddenly decelerated or brought to a stop, some of the energy is converted into electromagnetic radiation and um, not all of it. And some of it, only a small portion is useful. And then the rest of it um, is actually heat. I always jump ahead of myself. So the whole, the whole process of the elect, um, um, electron decelerating or stopping, it all happens inside of this tiny little glass tube inside of the tube head. So it's only it's only about this big. It's a very small space between the part that create the electrons and where the electrons halt. And it all happens in inside this tiny little tube. And I think next week we talk a little bit more about the actual parts, but you'll see if you look in chapter two, there's diagrams in, and that's why I kind of separated it because we don't get to that part until next week. So these are the four main points to just kind of break it down to kind of get it, you know, in easy steps, easy to understand steps. You, we're, you're going to need to generate the electrons, produce production of high speed electrons. You got to get them moving. You're going to, you want to focus them into a certain area so that you can all get them all going into a certain, in a certain direction. And then you want them to stop. So we'll talk about each step a little bit more here in depth, but those are your four main components that you need in order to create um, the X-ray. So the first one, the generation of electrons, um, you, need, you need a source. So you need a source of, an elect of electrons. And what they use inside of the little tube head is a little filament, it's a little curly, piece of metal and that metal is made out of tungsten it's a type of metal and they heat up um, the the metal is heated up um, until the electrons from uh, the tungsten atoms start kind of popping off and they start kind of popping off and they start hovering in an electron cloud is what it's called so it's an electron cloud and they call it called the boiling off or the popping off of the electrons um, from the tungsten filament is called thermionic emission. That's what the process is when the um, electrons are sort of separating from the tungsten atom. It's called thermionic emission. And then we call it an electron cloud has been formed and they don't go anywhere. They just hover um, in this area. They're now available. So now we have our available electrons that we need. So the first part of the process is um, is fulfilled. And we'll talk about this and in, in kind of review this in different ways, but this is controlled by the milliamperage. There's kilovolts and milliamperage. There are two different um, energy sources that do different things. And that's, so the milliamperage of the machine, or we call it just MA for short, because it's easier to say MA. That is what um, controls how many electrons you actually are making and how many are available. 
So um, we say that the electron cloud or the available electrons are controlled by the MA. And um, I wanna jump ahead. I'm not gonna jump ahead. So I have to stop my brain because I wanna talk about other things, but they're coming next week. Any questions yet? Yeah. Yes. It's probably a typo. What does it say? Oh, it should be, it, yes, yes, thank you. No, that's a typo. Electrons. So it says generate lots of elections. It should be electrons. Yeah, that's just a typo. Thank you. Okay, so then, so here's a picture. So here we have um, the little coil of tungsten, the little metal tungsten coil, and it's heated up. Um, and then you can just see a little cloud of electron forms around that um, tungsten filament. And those don't go anywhere yet. They're just hovering. So you've turned on the machine and we go through this process next week, but you've turned on the machine and voltage is starting to go into the machine. And when that happens, when you turn it on, that's when these electrons start hovering around the coil. So it's just the first step. So you press the on button and this happens inside the machine. You have this available, available electron cloud. So it helps, um, so here in the notes, you can see it helps to think about the tungsten wire or filament as not just a solid piece of metal, but you can kind of envision it as, I mean, anything, any hard structure is made up of atoms, right? So you can think of this tungsten wire as, as you know, bajillions of atoms. And so that's where we're getting these available electrons. Um, and you can see here, this is a schematic of, oh, I'm sorry, I keep using my cursor on my computer, but I should be over here. So this is a little schematic of a tungsten um, atom and the all of the um, shells or the orbiting electrons. And then the approximate binding energy or the KEV is just under 70. So this is gonna come, to, come into play um, and a little bit um, in a little bit when we talk about the stopping when the electrons go across and stop that you can see that that's a, the energy required to knock an electron that's in the K shell out of a tungsten atom. Okay, so number two, production of the high speeds. So you need so now you have these kind of hovering electrons and they're available, but now you got to get them to to move. You got to you got to get them to move fast and go in a direction. So you're going to need high voltage because the MA is actually very low voltage. We actually reduce the amount of electricity that comes out of the wall in order to um, get the electricity needed or the voltage needed to make the electron cloud. So, but now we need a different kind of energy source to that's actually very high voltage to really get these guys moving. So we need high voltage and that's gonna be cre um, created and controlled by the kilovolt peak or the KVP. So that is another important point. We have the electron cloud controlled by MA and we have the high voltage or the acceleration of electrons controlled by the kilovolt peak, um, peak or KVP. So those are two important things to know for future quizzes and exams. We call um, the boiled off electrons that are sent um, from two parts inside of this little back, this little glass tube in the in the x-ray tube head are called the cathode and the anode. It's two pieces. So we on the cathode side, we have the tungsten filament and they're gonna boil off uh, at the cathode side and then they're gonna sail across to the and hit the anode side. And we'll talk a lot more about that um next week too to show diagrams and everything but that's where they're going to be sent they're going to we want to send them in a high voltage fast accelerated electrons from one side to the other and those two sides are the cathode side and the anode side and like i said it's really small i mean it's only like literally like this big and the gap between the cathode and the anode are only about one to three centimeters it's a very small gap so electrons are always going to move in one direction. They're going to move from negative to positive. 
Um, and so that, and so we oftentimes will label these two sections, cathode and anode, we're going to label them negative and positive, and we'll show you that in a little bit too. So these are the requirements for getting the electrons to get moving. So a couple things about um, the cathode and the an or the anode, both the anode, the place where the electrons come to a stop is also made of tungsten. So we have a tungsten wire on the cathode side, and then we have a tungsten plate, which is where those electrons are going to stop. We have those on the anode side. So we have tungsten on both sides. Those are both um, metals. So we have those. And then we have um, a couple other metals that you guys are going to have to remember, but we won't talk about them right now. Um, let me make sure that I'm... Do you guys have any questions yet? Yeah. Tungsten plate. So on the on the anode side, the anode side, which um, is the um, positive side, because it goes from negative to positive, that it goes um, and hits a plate of tungsten, and that's where the actual stopping happens is on the anode side. It'll be a lot easier once you see a diagram. We, st we talk about that this is not the only time you're going to, um, we're, that we're going to talk about this and we'll revisit it. And when you see a picture, it actually, it helps them to visualize it. But yeah, the electrons go from the cathode tungsten filament and they go across to the anode tungsten plate. Yeah. Would you say again what, um, the, what's controlled by the AB2? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the acceleration of the electrons okay. is controlled by KDP. So you can think about the electrons as all just kind of jumping around, ready to go. Just them, their presence in a cloud is created by MA or milliamperage. But when they are ready to go and sail across to the anode, that's controlled by KDP or the kilovolt peak. Yeah, so it's not, so it's not positive, negative, like the protons, electrons, it's just the charge of it. So we have all, you have all of these um, electrons available in the cloud and on the cathode side, which is the negative side of the of the unit mm -hmm. and then because they're attracted to the opposite charge that helps them all fly over and you have the to the positive side which is the anode and there's some tricks to remembering positive and negative there's you know like some people just simply because um, cathode has cat cat at the beginning and cat sometimes sometimes can be kind of elude and like you can think of them as negative, <laughs> but that's so. And so some people say that like they get something like that in their head. There's a couple other ones that I'll share with you guys. Um, we oftentimes, um, well, I won't. I'll. There's a couple tricks to remember what side is positive and what side is negative, and we'll go over those. The cathode side is the negative. Oh, negative. Yeah, negative because it goes negative um, to positive. Okay, okay. Yes. Who said me? Me. Yes. <laughs> Who said me? Yes. Yeah. So the whole like from the electron cloud. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the cathode. Sorry, you guys. I I swear this. Everyone needs to shift this way. I don't. I always feel like I'm not looking over here. As I so I'm going to use my. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to use my pointer. So this. This point here with the cathode and the anode, we, when I pull up diagrams and things like this, this is going to help a lot. But basically, when you, like this um, previous slide here, you're going to have, so this side over here is the cathode side. And this is where you have the electron cloud. I'm so sorry. This is where you have the electron cloud. Um, so you have the electron cloud over on the cathode side. And then 
um, once you get that high voltage potential, it's gonna, all of these electrons that are just hovering around this filament are gonna fly over to the anode side, which is the positive side. And you don't have to, this is not the only time we're gonna talk about it. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go over it and show pictures too, and that's gonna help. But all these electrons are gonna fly over to the anode side, which is the positive side of the little tube inside of the whole unit. We, we can't see it yet, yeah. And um, this might make me like switch. <laughs> this might make me show the diagram first next time because it might help. I think it would help to clear it up. Once you know like what you're looking at, when you look at the whole unit and you can see the little tube inside of the, the whole kind of unit, it starts to, I feel like it starts to clarify it a little bit. So we, that's sort of the gist of it is that the electrons are sent from one side to the other but we're going to address it more than just this time. This is not the only time. Okay. Okay, so now focusing the electrons. So because the electrons stream from one side to the other, we want to sort of help them get from one side. I mean, they're going to naturally be attracted to a polar opposite, you know, a negative, a positive charge because they're negatively charged on this side that they're at but we wanna kind of help focus. So there's a piece of metal in there called the, um, the focusing cup. It's, and we don't have, you don't have, to, it's made of a different kind of metal, but we're not gonna have, you're not gonna be tested on that kind, but it's behind the filament. So it's this little rounded kind of focusing cup and then your filament is inside and you actually could see it better on this. Well, oh no, it doesn't show it, but it would be like right back here and it's just this little half, you know, scooped in kind of half circle. And it's a focusing cup. And it basically just helps direct them to the other side over to the anode. So that's the third part. Let me go up here. Um, the electron stream from the cathode, which is negative, to the anode, which is positive. And the focusing um, cup just helps to get them over there. So the focusing cup is designed to direct the electrons to your target. So you're trying to get all these these electrons that are boiling off the filament, you're trying to get them over to the anode side. So just think of like a, a direction, something that's just helping them all get over there in a good stream without them bouncing around or going off or they're just trying to get them all to one side. And then like charges repel each other, but remember we're dealing with a negative side and a positive side. So that's, they're all being drawn over to the other side because the charge is opposite. Okay. And yes. Um, I don't know if it's related, but is there like a reason like anions and anions and like is there a reason to split or are those separate? I think that's, that might be separate. I'm not I'm sure. sure. It would them, like if the cation is positive, but the cathode is negative. Mm -hmm. The cat, you know, I don't know because I don't know if that is it similar. Specific, yeah. I was wondering if they're like in the. I don't think so. I mean, it might. Sometimes these terms, like when it comes to this topic in general and physics and different, you know, there might be terms that sound related, but they aren't no, actually not. a part of this process. Got and that can be confusing when you've taken a lot of science courses, yeah. <laughs> which you guys have probably. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that that's anything from this process that we have to consider. So, uh, they're, they're just mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, we're not talking about those. Mm -hmm. The cathode... There, these are um, these are just specific parts in the machine. So it's in terms of unrelated mm -hmm. specific term of anode. There may be some relation somewhere, but nothing that we have to know about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, it could be on some level. There's make up the name because of something that's connected, but we don't have to. Okay. The less you need to know, trust me, you guys have so much stuff to memorize. The less. Not better. We don't want to add to it. There was a question earlier. Oh, there it is. Oh, the video, the YouTube video? Yeah, that was helpful. Yeah. 
Yes, and it's still in the slide deck, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So now the fourth, the fourth thing is the stoppage of the electron. So now we have um, the electrons. We've produced the electrons. We know that we need a high voltage to get them moving. And then we have a focusing cup to help get them over to the other side. Um, so now we want to stop them. And once we have those four pieces, then that's the four big pieces to create an X-ray beam. So almost all of the energy that's produced when we get to this point where we actually have the electrons flying over to the anode side, the um, almost all of the energy that's produced is going to come off as heat. So we, it's a very inefficient system, really. Once you um, press the exposure button and you actually create an X-ray beam, a central ray, um, most everything inside of that little glass tube is just is just heat. And so there's parts of, that there's parts of the machine that are meant to absorb the heat. So there's a copper stem that has the tungsten um, plate inside of it, and then there's all this insulating oil around it as well. And we'll, you can, we'll see that in some diagrams. But those, um, that's all there to absorb all of this heat that's being made. Because that's mostly what you're getting when you get this whole electron system happening is heat. And 1% is, is um, um, converted into a X-ray beam. So it's pretty inefficient. So the electrons, they hit this solid anode, this, um, this most of it is the copper stem. And then there's a little tiny, sheet of tungsten in just the right place where those electrons will hit that. And then when what comes off of that is 1% of an X-ray beam. So they're stopped abruptly. The kinetic energy of the electrons is converted to mostly heat and 1% X-ray. And they go, when they hit the, ana, um, the target, the tungsten target, the, the X-ray beams go in every single direction, but that your whole um, little tube there is all leaded glass except for one little tiny window. And so the the x-ray, the 1% of x-ray just looks like, you know, just like a burst. It goes everywhere. But the only ones that make up your central ray that come out to take an actual picture of a tube just comes out a little tiny unleaded window in, of this glass. So it's the whole thing is like crazy that we even end up getting, you know, like, but it shows how little you need to get to an exposed um, X-ray. Um, okay, so, oh, here finally, maybe I should have had this be like the first thing we looked at. Here finally is a picture of the little, um, and there is a, there is a YouTube video, like um, you said in here that there's actually, I thought I had two YouTube videos, but one of them is a little bit, it's a little slower. It's five minutes and the guy's explaining the parts. It's just a little bit slower. And then the other one is like an animation, which I thought was pretty good. It does. It shows sort of the process in an animation. So, um, so here we have on this side, we have the cathode side. You can't really see the filament. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. One of these days I'll figure it out. On this side, um, you have the, um, the cathode side, you can't really see the filament, but this is the focusing cup on this side. Um, and then somewhere in here where you can't really see is gonna be your tungsten filament. So a little tiny thin wire of tungsten metal um, and kind of inside of this focusing cup. And then the electrons, where'd my pointer go? And then the electrons, when you push the button, they're gonna fly over here to the anode side, but see how most of it is this um, copper stem this is copper colored, this is all just to absorb heat. And then embedded right in the middle is a tiny little tungsten plate and called the tungsten target. And it's actually, you actually want it to be incredibly small and that will play into reasons that we'll talk about later, but it helps with the quality of the image. So you don't want like a big old chunk of tungsten where the electrons can just hit anywhere. You want it to be very small and precise, and they come over and hit a very small um, target on the opposite side. Where's the what? The, oh, right here. So this, um, this is um, the anode, the whole, this whole side over here. So this is the cathode side, and this is the anode side on this side. 
So this is negative over here, and this is positive over here. And you can't really see the tungsten target because it's just in, it's flat, you know, it's coming, but it's just a little bit of tungsten metal embedded in the copper. It's the x-ray tube. It's, we have a name for it. We have the, we have, yeah, the tube head. Let me see, hold on. If it's in the next one. I know, I get it um, mixed up with the, the actual, the whole big unit. Cause then the unit, the whole thing. yeah, the thing that you're moving around in the room, is is much bigger than this and that's all filled with um oil so that yeah it's all filled with like insulating oil um because there's so much heat that's produced in this yeah so and that yeah so this is the this is a vacuum too oh my gosh i'm gonna have to look i'm gonna have to look up the specific name difference between this and then the x-ray unit the actual tube head um, but this, and then you can see over here, this is all glass and this is all leaded glass. So the x-rays cannot get out of this leaded glass area, except for a tiny little window of unleaded glass, you know, down wherever it is, you know, I'm not sure, you know, maybe down here somewhere. So this, this whole unit is, um, is leaded, leaded glass. Yeah. The focusing cup, or that so that's going to be over on this side. So this, you're pretty much looking at the focusing cup over here. You can't really see the tungsten filament because it's kind of hidden in the focusing cup. Yeah, it, because the focusing cup is basically like dipped in like this and then the filament inside of it. So when you look at it from the side like this, you can't, you can't see it. But it's in, it's, you know, maybe it's in back in here or something. That video that's on that he might show the filament because he's basically this next slide here, um, this one up here. Oh, this, this, yeah, the filament instead. Oh, instead of a wire, they always do diagram it as like a little wire, but maybe, maybe filaments, maybe the filaments can look a little different depending on the unit. There might be more than one way to construct the tungsten um, filament but um so this is this is a little video you might have to um, copy and paste it into the browser because it doesn't last night I tried clicking on it and then um I tried clicking on it and going right into the video and it didn't work on mine it may work on yours and then this is a little animation which basically just shows that whole thing that we just went through in a nice little animated way which is um I always like it when they break it down into those really easy steps. Okay, so um, page 14 um, of your textbook has a really good thorough, like there's however many steps, because I, I next week I, I do an activity where I have, I have all of the steps mixed up and then you guys have to like put them in order and then you kind of stand in order of the steps. And so it kind of helps you like, remember first, we got to do this first, we got to create electrons and we got to have this and we got to have this. But if you want to kind of start looking at that whole process as in a big, big picture, um, page 14 has them all broken down um, of the new text. So for the old, the last edition, I'm not sure. I don't think they actually had it. Um, I think that's something new for this edition. Cause I was like, oh, I, they hadn't written that out that way before. But this is just a quick schematic of the um, of the process. So here we have the cathode side over here. We have our tungsten filament. They show it curly um, in the in the animation. And then you see the electrons have boiled off. They're just hovering. But the arrow is saying that we want to get them over here to the anode side. So this is back here. This would all be copper except for this black area here is depicting the tungsten target. And they wanna go from the cathode to the anode. And so now um, the button has been pushed. So at A, at A, the button, like as the clinician, ready to push the button, you haven't pushed the button yet. You're, they're just ready. But at B, the stage of B, you've pushed the exposure button. 
And so when you're, and so after the button has been pushed and you've pushed the exposure button, those um, electrons are gonna come over here to the tungsten target and they're gonna hit it. They're gonna decelerate and bombard the target. And then we're gonna get kinetic energy. We're gonna get heat, which will be absorbed in the copper stem and in the insulating oil. And then we're gonna get X-rays coming off of the coming off of the target. So that's that is that. Okay. You guys think, I mean, you don't have to remember it all yet. We talk about it a lot again, but is that does that process seem pretty? Especially for those of you who haven't, I don't remember who hasn't had this and who has. It's leaded glass. Yeah. So it's glass um, that has, yeah, that has lead in it when they make up the glass. Um, and I don't mind repeating. Oh, I never mind. I'll say it because sometimes it helps to say it like four different ways. So did somebody have their hand raised? No. Did I imagine it? We were stretching. <laughs> Um, yeah. How far can the X-ray, once it hits and it's bouncing off, mm -hmm. how far do they go? Well, that's a great question, and we talk about that a little bit when we talk about scatter. Um, but obviously, your your um, BIV is very close to your patient's face, mm -hmm. and you want them to be very close. But the length of your BIV, the the part that comes out of the thing, you actually want it to be long because you want, I mean, and they make short ones. So many people have probably used really short ones, but it's actually more ideal to have them be long because they travel a little bit longer and it keeps them focused and a little bit instead of um, diverging. Like, because they, they will, an electron, an X-ray photon will just naturally diverge. It just, it just flares out. It's just, it's like, think of a, think of a flashlight and a light, the flashlight beam. It just spreads out and diffuses. But um, generally speaking, like we say, you know, like if you're six feet away or something like that, you generally, but ideally, I mean, any scatter or any electro, um, x-ray photon will be absorbed into like a very nearby wall. It will be absorbed into your patient's anatomy. Um, they'll be uh, basically walls, yeah, patient or walls, um, but they generally say staying out of the way like six feet, but theoretically, they could just still go until they hit something, so that's why our rooms are closed off, and you want the x-ray head pointed in a specific direction so that that scatter goes into a, and they used to say like, oh, the walls have to be leaded, like lead line walls, and they know that it, that's not true. You don't have to have lead line walls. You just have, I mean, sheetrock will absorb an, you know, an x-ray. You don't have to have lead lines. Okay, so now it gets into a little bit more of, a little bit more confusing topic. <laughs> um, so the two processes, and this, um, this is, it used to be a little bit more straightforward because we had only a certain kind of x-ray uh, unit in our off in our clinic, but now we have we got two new units, and they are slightly different. You can change the KVP on them. So um, it used to be able to we'd say, well, we only make one kind of X-ray. What kind of X-ray do we make? Um, either Bremsstrahlung or characteristic. But now I think we actually potentially could make both. Um, so I think you can change the setting. A lot of X-ray units you you don't have to change anything. A lot of times, if you do change something, you change the KVP, but you don't change the MA. Um, that's usually set. So you don't usually have to worry about that as a clinician. So now, so we'll talk about what's happening when the electrons hit the anode or the tungsten target on the anode um, and the two processes, that the two different types of radiation that's um, created, Bremsstrahlung and characteristic. And Bremsterlong is also called the general in your textbook. I think it's called like breaking or um, yeah or general. Isn't it also called general? I okay. Breaking radiation. Okay, so it's the most common um, process. Say, oh, say it again. Does it say general? Does it say general? Um, 
So Bremsstrahlung is the most common process. Um, and this is when uh, bombarding electrons, so that's what we call the electrons that are coming out of the electron cloud, as we call them a bombarding electron. It comes um, hurtling over, it comes over toward the tungsten target, and it gets really close to the nucleus. So this is when we start talking about that energy that is needed to dislodge a um, an, an orbiting electron. So the, the hurtling or, or the bombarding electron comes over, hits the tungsten target, and it gets really, really close to an electron um, close to the nucleus. So an inner orbiting ring, it gets really close. Um, and it slows down and in doing so, once it's slowing down or breaking, that's why they call it a breaking um, radiation, it gives off some X-ray photons or it gives off some energy. So just that, that motion of what it's doing, it has created X-ray. So just coming in, coming into this atom, this tungsten atom on the target and getting really close to the nucleus um, has released energy. So that's one thing. But it hasn't necessarily knocked anything out of the way. It's kind of like braked and then made a hard right or braked and made a hard left. And so as it's done that, it's created energy, but now it's gone on and it can hit another tungsten atom, but it might hit another tungsten atom somewhere else and release a different amount of energy. So it, it has a variation of the type of energy that it's going to release. So now the same electron that made this, the first X-ray could do the same thing to another tungsten atom until all of its energy, until it just dissipates, uses itself up and it doesn't do it anymore. And so that's why with this type of radiation, um, we find different energy levels, different wavelengths. And like the notes say, we'll talk about wavelengths. Yeah. Is the most um, common. It depends on the setting of the machine. So you know the textbook might have might say something about that, but I think it, um, I think it depends on the machines that we use. Because like if all your machines are set at seventy kBc, then you're probably doing characteristic. So um, I think it depends on the the machine that is used in the office. There was a question back here. What Tungsten. So yeah, tungsten, tungsten, tungsten. We talk about tungsten a lot. Tungsten and copper, the, the focusing cup is made out of molybdenum or something. It's a, I, I just don't touch the on it because I don't like the word. And this creates a um, different type of energy and it, or it can make the general radiation. So it's, it, also called it's like I think it has basically like three names. So Bremsstrahlung is it's called breaking um, radiation, Bremsstrahlung radiation breaking, or general. So those are it's called I, in the test though I refer to it as Bremsstrahlung. So when I'm testing you guys on it, I I use the word Bremsstrahlung. But in the textbook you'll see other um, names. But it creates like different types of energy. Different levels of energy. So different different levels of energy um it it and it develops or in well, radiation and energy like are you yeah gonna that's what I was gonna re I was gonna reword my sense. So okay. it it produces different um radiation with different energy levels. Okay. It produces radiation with different energy levels and it produces flash radiation with different wavelengths. And that matters because depending on the wavelength and the energy of the radiation, it's going to affect the image quality. So all of this kind of comes together. Like it's weird to say something just sort of out of hand, like because you don't really have anything. You don't understand why that's important to even say. But it all kind of these first several lessons sort of all come together and sort of talk about the same thing just in pieces because there's so much to cover. But yeah, so Bremsstrahlung ends up creating radiation of different energy levels and different wavelengths. I was going to take a sip and I forgot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Great question. So I have historically made my own, but in the new textbook, there's a lot of questions in there. And so I'm going to look at those questions. And so my quiz won't come like just from it because I also want it to align. I want it to make sense and align with the PowerPoint. So because I want you to be, recognize the 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 terminology and the sort of flow of the PowerPoint. But there are a lot of pre-made questions in the textbook. And that's very handy because usually they're very well vetted questions. Like they're good at writing test questions. And test questions can be difficult. Like some people can understand a concept, but if the question is too wordy or a word is used that they're not familiar with, it can throw people off. So I'm definitely very likely going to pull some um, quiz questions from the textbook. Um, just but not, really not all of them. Yes, I might change the name. Yes, because I want it to all be copacetic and sort of flow so that you yeah. recognize it from what we covered. It will be on exam soft. So usually like, so by, by Friday, I'll have posted it and you'll get the, um, you'll be able to download it probably on Sunday or Monday because it's your class is Tuesday. So you'll be able to download the quiz on Monday and then I'll give you the passwords um, it, when we come into class. So you'll, so don't forget to download it on Monday. It's because a lot of times people forget and then, you know, because it closes, you can't download it once class starts. I mean, you can, I'll open it for you, but um, you know, it's just an extra thing to do. So if you remember to download quizzes on Monday for this class, and then you get the passwords um, when we start. Sorry for both. No. Uh, it's the, what comes out of your electron cloud. So it's those available electrons. And I think they call it bombarding because it's actually hitting the target. No, they're just the electrons that are in the electron cloud that are coming out. Okay, so then the other type of radiation is characteristic radiation. Um, characteristic radiation is um, different and it's different in a a big way where it actually comes in contact with an electron. You can see in the picture here how it comes in and it actually, the bombarding electron, so that's your available electron from your electron cloud, and it comes in here and it actually hits um, an electron in the orbit and it knocks it out. It hits a K-shell. Um, I like reading my notes sometimes because sometimes I've said it very concisely. So it hits a K shell um, this, and that's the shell that we talked about that's closest to the nucleus. So it takes the most amount of energy to knock that electron out. So it, it takes the most amount of um, energy from this bombarding electron to knock this electron out of orbit inside of the tungsten target, an atom of um, tungsten from the, on the tungsten target side. So it knocks it out, and when it knocks it out, you have to get a rearranging all of the electrons because you know how everything wants to stay in balance, and so the you know it's trying to stay in balance. So all of the electrons sort of rearrange and come in closer to the nucleus, and when you get that filling of those vacancies or that rearranging of the um, of the electrons, that that whole process, knocking it out and the rearranging, creates a central ray or radiation or um, an x-ray, x-ray photons. Mm -hmm. That's your, yes, yeah, your radiation or your um, x-ray photon is created. The, the, the thing that says characteristic radiation here, that's your beam of X, your x-ray beam or your x-ray photon. There's a negative charge electron. So this, so this is your bombarding electron comes over from your electron cloud, which is the negative side, and it flies over to your positive side, the tungsten target, and this is one atom in your tungsten target, one atom of billions of atoms, um, and it specifically hits an electron in the K-cell. So it's like that good aim, and it hits 
right in and it knocks the K-cell electron out on the and this is the anode side. So this whole schematic thing, we're talking about atoms of tungsten that are on the on the anode side. So they come in from the electron cloud and they knock out an electron. It doesn't, um, it doesn't take it, 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 it dies. So it flies over and it knocks it out. And in that process, it's done. It's gone and the electron is out of orbit. And then all the other electrons kind of like, beep, 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 and they like fill in the, um, the, shells and and they rearrange and I'll get you know rearranged back up closer to the nucleus. I would just, I'll read what it's saying, but basically it produces, that's how it produces X, the X-ray beam. Like that's really all you, you need to know. The most important thing, the most important concept that you, that I want you guys to know for this is that it's getting, it's going to the inner shell. That's point number one. I should have these in like bold points, points that you'll be tested on, <laughs> things that you want to know. It's, it's knocking out a K-shell electron. That's a big point. And, the, and then the other electrons rearrange. And that process of knocking out the K-shell electron and rearranging the other electrons in the other orbiting shells produces the radiation. So that is a different concept than a bombarding electron coming real close to the nucleus and then turning off and taking a hard right and then going off and doing it again and again and again. So you can, you want to start to visual, like you want to understand conceptually those two main differences between Bremsstrahlung and characteristic. One is like veering off and, and can hit several atoms and create different powers. And the other one is one hit and done. One and done. Yeah. So we're with the characteristic radiation for the capital B, which is uh, the radiation to hit the K, K electron into the ejected hydrogen that goes before the anode side, correct? This is all happening on the anode side. So this all this whole thing happens on the anode side. And that sometimes thinking about where stuff is happening can can be kind of confusing. But yeah. It, it probably all happens like so fast that it's probably hard, but one thing has to happen first before the other things. But that process, yeah. So like the process of knocking it out and then the rearranging, that's when you get, you know, and it all happens instantaneously, you know, but one thing has to happen first, which is the, the K shell electron gets knocked out first, and then you get the rearranging. See how it shows like the little purple guys, like this guy moves into here, this guy moves into here, this guy moves into here. And so rearrangement of orbiting electrons to fill the vein can see, um, and you get the, yeah. So I wouldn't, I would not ask you a question like, like is X-ray, is radiation produced when the um, electron is knocked out or when they are rearranged? Like, I wouldn't ask you that question because I don't think it really matters. You have to have the process. And, and so that's, so I would want you to know the difference, the main difference between characteristic radiation and Bremsstrahlung, like the main process difference. Yeah. Which the main difference would be that the other one comes close mm -hmm. and then it comes the other one comes close and veers off and it can it can do that un, until it runs out of energy whereas this one goes in knocks it out and it's done so you can't get one electron can only make characteristic x-ray one time yeah yeah um, Oh, that's a good question. 
But you do get lots and lots of, um, you have lots of um, electrons. When you push the button, you have lots of electrons that go over. I would, I kind of want to say yes, because you probably can have a combination, but if you're set at 70 kV, which some machines are just set at 70, you're probably only making characteristic, yeah. and you're probably yeah. not making Bremsterlong. Um, that's a really good question that I'm not like 100% sure of the But I, I want to say in some circumstances it probably is. But actually, no, no. If you aren't, if your machine is not capable of going to 70, you'd never make characteristic radiation because you have to have that much power to knock out a K-shell electron. So so not necessarily. So now does a machine set at 70 also make Brumstrahlong? That I'm not totally sure. Maybe. But I know that if you're set at if your machine is set in less than 70, you can't make characteristic. So I know half the answer. <laughs> is Brumstrahlong? So maybe if you're at 70, you can make Brumstrahlong. But if you're not at 70, you can't make characteristic. Uh, just a small question for uh, Brent's phone. Um, could you just write like, you, you have to know how to spell the whole word. No, it's you're never going to have to write it out. You just have to recognize it. I won't, yeah. <laughs> It'll be a spelling bee. Spell from Jolong. Okay. Question? Oh. Yes. Yes. So you will definitely have a question. You will definitely have a question on a test that mixes up these processes on purpose. So it could say knocking out of a of a L shell or knocking out of a N shell. You know, or something like that. So I, you'll, there's there's questions on there that will will, will um, purposefully sort of mix up the process. So you want to know the real process. Inner shell. Yes, inner shell um, characteristic knocks out a K shell, which is your closest shell to your nucleus. Okay. Yes. So it not It it you know I suppose it could, but it's not considered characteristic uh, radiation. Oh, okay. and so. It's, so you get a stronger, yeah, it comes in, um, comes in close to the nucleus and then veers off. But that's, you get different, uh, different powers because you can get it, it can probably do that in different areas. So the, a key point for Bremsterlong is the variability. You get variations in energy levels and variations in wavelength. And we'll talk about wavelength. So you might, so I might mix things up like call characteristic um, Bremsterlong and vice versa, or or say something like instead of a K shell, say a P shell or in you know, one of the outer rings. So just know those general processes, and you don't have to dig too deep. Just know what's on the what's on the slide. Like if there's if the textbook goes into a little bit more depth and says some extra things that I didn't talk about, you don't need to know that for a test. You just need to know specifically what um what I said. It just sums it up we were kind of saying that for the characteristic uh, radiation you would need a higher not the scale. You need at least seventy, yeah. And so then, mm -hmm. if you move further out of the like the cell, you can need a lesser mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because you like a lot of these machines are set at 65 kbp, and so that they just are, and you can take fine x-rays, but you have higher power, and when you have a higher power x-ray, you generally get a better image because you, you want, you want higher power. Okay, so we started at, do you guys want to take a little break? Okay, let's take a um, five, seven-ish minute break. We don't have too much more. This is good. I think you guys are getting it. I feel very good about this. I love how everyone's made 
Yeah, well, first things are good because I get to repeat it over and over, and I think that's all it is. Is what's hard to get it up? You're like, okay, I'm in different ways. Move in different ways. So questions are good. Hi. Yes. Yes. Here, let me just pause the recording. Just so. Okay. So we're we're gonna move on from there. And um in the textbook, there's a little paragraph. This so when I inherited this class, there was a slide and, and a question. There was at least one question on the quiz or exam on particulate radiation, and there was like a slide. But, and so I, I kept it in there, but I like to boil it down to one bullet point that all you really need to know about particulate, because we, we're dealing with electromagnetic radiation. That's what we're dealing with. So I feel like that's what we will spend our time talking about. I don't feel like we need to spend time talking about particulate particularly because we've, because we're just, you know, we're not, deal, we're not making it when we take x-rays. So um, there is a little bit more of a blurb about it in the textbook if you want to read about it or if you have some understanding about it from some other aspect of life, but that's fine. But you don't need to know much more than what's on this slide. And even this over here is is more than you really need. Well, I, I mean, who knows? never mind. I won't say that. Never mind. Just this is all you need to know. This is on the slide. And what, I've, what I have um, bolded here are the most important things. So particulate radiation, they're tiny particles of matter that um, possess mass. So that's important to know. They possess mass. They travel in a straight line at high speeds. So there's a lot of similarities, you know, in some ways to electromagnetic radiation, but they possess mass. That's a very big difference. And they do contain a charge. However, you will notice that neutrons have mass, but no charge, but in general, if a question on an exam or a quiz says some, you know, gives you the impression that all particulate doesn't have a charge um, or, or does contain a charge, just go with it. Don't be like, wait a minute, there was the neutrons and that had no charge. But I, I put it there so we can be accurate. But in general, when you think of particulate radiation, think possesses mass and contains a charge. That's really all you need to know. Particulate radiation has mass and charge, you know, and like I said, to be very, very accurate, neutrons are a little different. They have mass, but no charge, but we're not going to worry about that technicality. And we're just trying to differentiate for ease of understanding because we just don't need to know more than that, really. Um, and there's different types of particulate radiation. They kind of are divided into these um, categories, alpha particles, protons, neutrons, and then electrons. And then the electrons are classified by beta particles and then the cathode rays. You remember we talked about the cathode rays in the beginning. That's what Renkin, Renkin was the one that discovered the X-ray originally. Um, that's what he was working with was the cathode ray. Um, so that's really all you need to know. So we'll move on from there. Any questions on that? Yeah, as, as far as particulate radiation goes, that's all you need to know. And the difference. Well, you'll, you'll, yeah, it, the, the difference between particulate and electromagnetic, this is, this will help you, those two things that it um, has mass and charge will help you stand out the difference between this and electromagnetic because electromagnetic has um, neither. So that will help you differentiate between the two. Okay. Um, but when it comes to particulate, that's pretty much all you're gonna be asked about is the mass and the charge of particulate radiation. Okay, so electromagnetic radiation, um, the, um, the different types of electromagnetic radiation are dependent on how they're made and their wavelengths. So there's a whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation and the differences all reside on sort of their source, you know, where it's, what, where it's coming from and its wavelength. So it's gonna, um, 
So some is going to be far more benign and not really do much of anything. And other things can be quite serious and you don't want to spend too much time around it. Examples of electromagnetic radiation include radio waves. You know, we're kind of surround, like we are swimming in waves of different types, especially with, you know, all the cell towers and everything. But radio waves, they're very long wavelengths. And then um, compared to something like a gamma wave, which um, would be something like for a um, PET scan. Um, and that has very high energy um, and very short wavelengths. And we'll go over wavelengths, um, I think that's next week, but there's a picture here next to. But here's a few points um, to know about electromagnetic radiation. Uh, magnetic radi electromagnetic radiation can be defined as the propagation of a wave-like energy without mass. So there's no mass, but there is mass to particulate. So that you see the difference there. Particulate has mass, electromagnetic has no mass. And um, so it goes um, in a straight line, in a, in a the, it goes in a straight line, but also in a wave pattern. And that can sound very confusing, but we'll show a picture of that through space or through matter. So matter being like a jawbone or take or a tooth to take a picture, to take an x-ray. X-ray um, electromagnetic radiation are believed to move through space, space as both a particle. So that's where it kind of goes like in sort of a straight line and a wave. Therefore, there's the two concepts, the particle concept and the wave concept. And so this is very abstract. This gets into like the physics realm of like, what are you talking about? But so my um, one person described it to me as a surfer riding a wave. They're theoretically going in a straight line, but they're riding a wave. Things are, things are moving around them. So we don't have to think about it in too much depth, thank goodness, um, but understanding that there are these um, concepts um, out there, those two main concepts. There's the particle concept and the wave concept. The particle concept characterizes electromagnetic radiation as a discrete bundle of energy called the photon. So that's why we call it an X-ray photon. And sometimes, I, even up here when I'm talking, I the words get jumbled and I might and that accidentally say proton, um, but we don't want to say proton, it's photon. So um, that can get a little bit confusing at times um, when you're thinking of all these different terms, but those are different. So here's a little um, example of the electromagnetic wave. Um, you can see how this inside here, this black line is moving straight ahead, but there's like a wave motion around it. I don't, I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to attempt to clarify this much more than the surfboard illustration, mm -hmm. because to me, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, but, and it's happening, but you, we're not going to test on it in depth. So um, this is pretty much as far as we need to understand it for this class. We're not, we're not physicists, right? We're going to be dental hygienists. <laughs> There's a difference, but it is interesting, but it is interesting. So the wave concept um, characterizes electromagnetic radiation as waves and focuses on the properties of velocity. So how fast it's moving, wavelength, long and short. So we have to understand these, these concepts and then frequency. So how many peaks? Um, are in a certain segment of that of that wavelength of that section, and so all of those things do matter when we talk about X-ray radiation because they affect the film. So there are some things we got to talk about when it comes to all this. The wavelength is defined as the distance between the two peaks. So the wavelength is defined as the distance between the crest of one wave. So here we have the crest, the top, the peak of one wave, or the crest of one wave and the crest of the next, this is the wavelength. And this distance can be long or it can be short. So long and short. And um, wavelengths determine the energy and the penetrating power of radiation. And that really does matter when we take x-rays. If we, we, want, we want good, penetrating, strong radiation um, to get the job done. It's, it can, and we talk about this more in bi the biology part too, it can cause more damage because it's stronger, but you need fewer of them and they get the job done. 
So instead of like having tons and tons of weak radiation, that's just like, blah, 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 we just get in there and do what we need to do. And so in the end, it ends up being much more effective and better for the patient. You need, you know, you need fewer radi um, radiation particles or photons and um, you get a clearer image. So it's, it's better to have a stronger, uh, more powerful beam. So the shorter the distance between the crests, so the shorter the distance here, the shorter the wavelength or the distance between the crests, um, the higher the energy and the ability to penetrate matter. So it's going to, so if we have like a, you know, a bigger jawed individual, um, we want a stronger, more powerful um, x-ray to penetrate their jaw and show us the teeth and all these different, you know, or if there's more flesh, thicker muscle, whatever, you know, you can think about different scenarios. You want a good x-ray beam to penetrate um, the face. The frequency refers to the number of wavelengths that passes a given point in a certain amount of time. So um, frequency and wavelength are sort of, um, what's the word that inversely related is what I put there. So if you have a shorter wavelength, so let's say you're measuring, let's just put it in like conceptually easy to understand. If you're measuring an inch of wave, uh, an inch of um, the, the radiation beam, if you have a short wavelength, you're gonna have, you know, a billion or whatever, um, the frequency is going to be higher, right? Because you're going to have, it's a shorter wavelength, you're going to have more peaks. So your frequency is higher. If you take that same inch and your wavelengths are very um, long, then your frequency is going to be much lower because you only have a quarter of the peaks. So you can think about it as like counting the peaks. And if the frequency is high and the wavelengths are short, frequency high, wavelength short, you're going to have a more powerful beam. So I like to draw a, pic a picture of it. I just think if you draw the picture and you like say it while you're drawing the picture, they do it up here, but they know where to write. Um, but, you know, so like lots and lots of peaks is a short wavelength and a high frequency. Fewer peaks is a long wavelength and a uh, lower frequency. What else do I have in this note? If you'll notice, um, if I, the note says, if you'll notice in the animation, the two fields, the magnetic field and the electric field are two wave-like fields running perpendicular to each other. However, the radiation or X-rays are always traveling in a straight line. It's sort of like a surfer. Oh, there's like a surfer on a wave. The water moves around them in a wave, but the surfer travels in a straight line. Okay. Velocity refers to the speed of the wave. All the electric, um, electromagnetic radiation travels as, wa um, as waves or as a continuous sequence of crests at the speed of light. That's another important thing to note is that um, X-ray particles um, move at the speed of light. So that's another, there's, and the end of the chapter kind of summarizes the, care, the properties of an X-ray uh, photon. And that is one of them. It says it at the end of the chapter, but that's one that you'll want to know is that as it's moving through space, it's moving at the speed of light, which is pretty fast. Okay, so here we go. Just basically, I this is what I just said. So wavelength, short, they're going to have greater penetration power, higher energy, higher frequency. They're going to go through matter better. They're going to go through matter. They're going to go through cheeks and jaw bones and muscles and teeth better. Um, wavelengths that are long, they're going to be lower penetration, lower energy, lower frequency, and they're going to get absorbed in the jaw and the muscle and the teeth and the all the different things more. So you're going to get a fuzz, like a fuzzier ghost, you know, ghostly image. You're going to get a foggy image with um, weaker x-rays instead of nice crisp shades of gray where you want them and black and white where you want them. Um, okay. And then here's just the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just kind of fun to look at. And you can see where the x-ray machine is, is, you know, I mean, it 
it does biological damage if you know if you use it too much so it's on the end of the ionizing which um is more um is you know obviously the what we're concerned with when it comes to health and that sort of thing um then down on this end we have the things that kind of come off more as just heat um you know like your cell phone there's i know there's lots of studies about that um with cell phones and cell towers and things like that um for the um the radiation that comes off of them but i've heard some say that it's just heat but i don't that's i did a little research and then i stopped because i was like i don't know um, I don't know if I want to know the answer with all of the wireless earbuds living in my head all the time. But um, anyways, but it's kind of neat to see the non-ionizing um, versus the ionizing, um, the visible spectrum. So that's just more, um, you don't, I, this, you don't get specifically tested on this. You don't have to necessarily memorize what's on what end of the spectrum. It's just kind of interesting to look at this. Um, and this is just the same one, just a different, um, this shows the, the actual measurements of the, um, the wavelengths. And again, you don't have to memorize these numbers. It's just sort of more interesting. X-rays are measured in nanometers, you see in the notes here. So they're one billionth of an inch. That's tiny. So um, just some kind of almost nice to know. That's not really need to know. You don't get tested on that. So here's some characteristics um, of x-rays. So x-rays, they behave like light. And that will, we'll talk a little bit more about that too in the way it's sort of like when it comes out of the x-ray beam, it sort of is um, divert, kind of um, spans out like a flashlight, like a light beam. And so it behaves like light in that way. Um, spreads over distance like a beam of light. It's invisible travels in a straight line. So if it comes out of the machine like this, it keeps going like that until it hits something and then it might get scattered, but it heads, it doesn't all come out of a, the end of a X-ray like this and just go, whoop. it kind of just goes like this. So we want to, that's why we um, do certain things to get it going where we, where we want it. And some of it's a little counterintuitive. Like you might think, oh, if I have a really short um, BID, it's, closer to the face so it'll but it actually spreads out why it has a wider spread and we we go over that in another chapter but so it's actually more ideal to have a longer um, bid um, travel in a straight line penetrate materials that absorb or reflect visible light um, it's uh they're ionized atoms produce fluorescence of certain substances that's um, what Renkin noticed in his dark room was that the, it was fluorescing a piece of metal in there um differentially absorbed by matter so it's going to be so say that's why and we talk about this in more depth but that's why you get white and black on an x-ray is that the white totally absorbed all your x-ray it absorbed all of it and none of it got to your sensor so that's why you have the the, the really radiopaque the super super white it absorbed all of them so you got nothing on your sensor. Um, and then where you have, where it's super black, like almost none of them get absorbed. And so they all hit the sensor. So that's, so it differentially absorbs the extra, the matter differentially absorbs the x-rays in different amounts. And that's what leads to those shades of gray. Um, produce, and then produces biological change. So when people are concerned about radiation, they're concerned about atoms being ionized because when you ionize an atom in the body, you can cause biological damage. We talk about that um, in week three, I think. Um, I don't, oh, I guess I just did, Never mind. Okay, so that is, is that the last slide? Oh, here's, oh, here's the property. So I cut and paste this from, from the um, book. This is a little bit more in depth. This is just straight out of the um, textbook. And I know it's very wordy. You're not supposed to do wordy slides, but I just liked it because it kind of, so this is pretty much saying what the other slide said. The other slide just said it in a much more sort of to the point manner. But if you want a little bit more um, verbiage for each point, then this gives goes into just a little bit more explanation. If you don't find it helpful and you find it confusing, you, it's it's okay. It's you don't have to, um, but this just gives a little bit more explanation for each one. But these are the main uh, properties that are it's kind of summarized. So you might get a question that says, you know, like a multiple 
choice question that has three of these characteristics and then one that's like not this, you know, it, um, you know, it might say that they're um, travel in a squiggly line, <laughs> you know, I don't know. And so you just, so you want to be familiar with the main properties of, of, um, of an x-ray, main characteristics of an x-ray. Yeah. Yes, yes. So things, you know, so that some, you know, like a, a big jawbone or metal in the mouth and, you know, things like that, those things are going to absorb more radiation. Um, I am going to, do I have time to? Oh, no, no, no. I'm gonna, really quick. I'm going to um, go to pull up the Moodle course really fast. I'm going to stop this.